Good morning. We continue this morning in our study of the book of John. We're in John chapter 1. We're going to begin this morning at verse 35. John 1, 35. Last week we were touching on the ministry or really from last couple weeks been looking at the ministry of John the Baptist and we talked about his preparing the way for the Lord the coming of the Lord and so uh, in the next few verses and through especially this <clears throat> this the end of this chapter we kind of see how the work of John the Baptist uh, was able to prepare the way of the Lord in getting disciples ready who were looking for the Messiah and when he was come that they would be uh, disciples really no longer of John but would become disciples of Christ and he must decrease as Jesus would increase and so it says uh, in verse 35 again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked he said behold the Lamb of God and the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them what seek ye they said unto him rabbi which is to say being interpreted master where dwellest thou he said unto them come and see they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Peter, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. We'll kind of stop there for now. Uh, we may get a little bit further along the way, but as we begin to look at what John is, the apostle, is showing us about the work of John the Baptist, he had been talking to uh, the religious leaders that were sent from the Jews about who he was, and he had been talking to them about uh, the fact that he was witness of the Holy Spirit descending and staying on Jesus as a sign given him uh, by God as to who the Messiah would be. And so he was testifying in essence to the uh, Jewish leaders as to who uh, he was. And as he was talking to them about who he was, his disciples were also hearing the things that he was saying about the one that was coming after him. And they were comparing who John said he was to who John said he was looking for and who John said ultimately that he had found. And so the following day from that, John says, John, that is the Baptist, and two of his disciples were standing together. And John, looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. We can see that John and Jesus were in the vicinity of each other, but it doesn't necessarily mean at the same time they were with each other in the sense that they were directly working together uh, with their disciples, the disciples of Jesus, the disciples of John, all of, of that. And so at this time, it was kind of at this point a little bit separated. Jesus was out uh, teaching and preaching and John was teaching and preaching, but Jesus had been baptized and so John recognized who he was we remember that after Jesus was baptized he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was there for 40 days 
And then when he came out of the wilderness, he began preaching and teaching for the need of repentance for the kingdom of heaven uh, was at hand. He began to preach the same thing John did. And so John, with standing with two of his disciples, see Jesus, and he points him out to them, saying, Behold the Lamb of God. Ultimately, the sacrifice for sin. Now, that's an interesting statement because right off the bat, as John introduces the two disciples to Jesus, he does so with the anticipation that Jesus is a sacrifice. He doesn't say, you know, behold the Messiah. But according to John's account, he says, behold the Lamb of God. And Peter later will describe Jesus in, in 1 Peter 1 saying that, you know, he was a, a lamb without spot, without blemish, foreordained before the foundation of the world. Those who insist on saying that Jesus came to establish a kingdom and that the Jews rejected Him and God was forced to substitute the church for the kingdom until Jesus can come back. We, we hear that all the time. It's the very central heart and theme of what we know as premillennialism. The belief that the kingdom has never been established on earth. But we can see from the very beginning that John the Baptist was aware of the fact that Jesus was not just the Messiah, and don't misunderstand me, that being the Messiah is important, but what John was, was saying was that not only was He the Messiah, but He was going to be the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And so even John the Baptist knew that Jesus was not going to be setting up a kingdom the same. He did not know all of the ins and outs, but he understood that Jesus was going to be a sacrifice. The Lamb of God. The Lamb of God is a, a phrase, it's a term that's used because of the, the Passover lamb and other sacrifices which are made uh, and so a lamb, while yes, it was for used as pets and it was used for many other things, its primary purpose in that sense was a, an, a sacrificial purpose. And so he speaks to his disciples and he tells them that uh, he is the Lamb of God. And when he says that, the two disciples that heard him speak they followed Jesus. This is really what John the Baptist was doing. John was preparing the way of the Lord. He created and made disciples first of his own, but then those disciples he introduced to Jesus. And we see a perfect example of the transfer here. Those who John had prepared he pointed the way for them, and they began to follow Jesus. And this is the interesting thing, because when we read some of the other Gospels, it just seems to read like Jesus just happened to be walking by some people one day and said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And They didn't know Jesus from anybody else, and, but they just dropped their nets and gave up their businesses and left what they were doing to follow Him. And, you know, in that sense, it really doesn't make any sense that someone would follow a stranger to that extent. But once we see what John has to say, John fills in, if you will, some of the blanks that we find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in his purpose and his reason and how he did that. And so they started following Jesus. And as they went, it says, then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? Now, they already 
with some of the things John had been explaining to them and some of the things that was going on, notice the phrase that they use. They call Jesus rabbi. Now, why would you call a man a rabbi? You know, the, the word rabbi means master or teacher. So why would they call Jesus teacher? Why would they call him a master or a teacher? If they were just introduced to him, why would they call him that? Because John had prepared them. John had prepared them in the fact that there was one coming after him that was greater than him. He was preferred before him. And he talked about all of these things that we see here. And so when John pointed them to Jesus, he called him the Lamb of God. Well, that's a sacrifice. But at the same time, they understood that Jesus was also a teacher. And so they had either heard of his teachings from others, or John had told them about the teachings. So Jesus was there where John was. And so the, the term rabbi is not necessarily a formal title. It's not something where you're necessarily ordained to be a rabbi. It just means a teacher. And so uh, this morning I'm standing here teaching you and from the biblical standpoint, that makes me a rabbi. That makes me a master or a teacher. And so anyone who was teaching was considered to be that. Now today, in a more formal way, in the synagogues and all, they have a rabbi, a teacher, just like we have preachers who've been set apart to the specific purpose. But they were prepared. They were well prepared because John didn't have to say, why don't you guys go and follow him and see where he's going? And, you know, he just says, behold, the Lamb of God. And they follow and they want to see. They want to investigate. As they followed Jesus, he turns around and he says, what seek ye? You know, why are you following me? What are you looking for? And so that's, a, that's an interesting question for many standpoints, but it, it also helps us to understand a little bit. You know, you, you don't, the, the curiosity is there. And so the first thing that they answer and say is, where dwellest thou? That's an interesting answer because uh, are they just interested in the kind of house that Jesus lives in? Is it some of that stuff they want to see if he's living in a big mansion and everything's like that. You know, it's, it's not necessarily that, but the statement that they're making, where dwellest thou, is really a, a request, if you will, in those kind of places and countries. It's, it's a request to extend to them hospitality. We, we would like to see where you live. We, we would like to come to where you're at. And so in, in a way, what they're asking for is, we would like you to extend to us some hospitality. And it tells us here that, that it was the 10th hour. That means that it was 4 o'clock. And so 3 o'clock was the evening prayers. And then we, we move in to the evening. And so it's after the time of the evening prayers. It's moving into what in, in West Virginia we call supper time. It's, it's getting to the place where we're thinking about eating supper and, and uh, finding a place to lay down and go to sleep. Uh, night is coming. And so in their unique way and in the customs of of that part of the world, they really were asking Jesus for hospitality. They were asking Him, uh, they would like to go with Him and be and see, when they say they want to see where thou dwellest, it's, it's kind of a, a request for Him to provide uh, some things for them for the night. Now, when we just read it through Gentile ears, we don't always catch all that, but that's, that's really what's going on here. 
And so they invite themselves. And in the custom of that area, that's why the Hebrew writer says, you know, that we ought to be careful to entertain strangers because people have entertained angels unaware. Uh, and in that part of the world, the extending of hospitality sometimes was a matter of life and death because uh, where there was limited resources of food and water and uh, where there may have been robbers and peril and other things uh, of that nature, uh, it was quite common for people to show up. Uh, we have a, a term that we kind of use now uh, we, we, at least we used to, I guess people still do, the guest room. Uh, we have the guest room. There's usually, when I was growing up in everybody's house, there was a bedroom that was designated the guest bedroom. Now, somebody may have been sleeping in there, but you knew when your aunt and uncle came, you knew, you just knew that your bed was going to be the one that got used because that was the guest bedroom and when they were coming you know your sister or brother's room may have been a mess and we'll just pull the door shut on that one but you also knew that mama said your room needs to get cleaned up because we've got company coming and so people had this concept even in jesus day even more so without the uh, you know, the, the Motel 6 and Motel 8 or whatever it is all over the place and Holiday Inns. And many people would lodge strangers up on the roof of their house. There were steps up to the, to the roof of the house. And that even works that way to a certain extent today. If you uh, look at the, the building, if you've seen the video that we have posted up about uh, the, uh, the school there in in India, there are steps that go up to the upper part. And in the olden days, to that second story, uh, the, the steps were separate and apart from the regular house. And so people could stay up on the roof and they had places prepared for them there or they may have had an actual guest room. So with all that being said, these people wanted to be with Jesus for a period of time. They at least wanted to know some things about Him. And there's no better way to learn who someone is, perhaps, than to sit down at a meal. You know, meal and has always been a thing of, of fellowship. It's a time of sharing. Uh, we, we even talk about that, the word that we, we use for communion is common union, which is also the word that's translated fellowship. And so uh, they are requesting hospitality. They are asking for a privilege to sit down with Jesus and be with Him, see where He lives. It's not just wanting to see the building with physical eyes, but they wanted you know, to, to be there and see who He was and where He was. And so... Uh, it, it tells us here, uh, when he asked that, he said unto them, come and see. And so they ask for him to extend hospitality. We would like to go with you and see where you live and be where you are. Uh, we, we would like to do that. And so asking, he says, come and see, which basically means come along let's 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 get on with it let's let's go come and see and so they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day for it was about the tenth hour of four o'clock and so we we do definitely see that Jesus didn't just say come and see that is come and there's the building now y'all go your way uh, they, they abode with him that day because it was the fourth hour, uh, or it was the tenth hour, it was four o'clock in the afternoon. And so they had the opportunity to spend the evening with Jesus. And then, uh, after having had the opportunity to spend some time with him, uh, one of them, it says, which heard John and followed him, that is Jesus, was Andrew. Simon Peter's brother. Now, 
here's how things kind of work. Uh, Peter wasn't uh, one of the first ones in that, that sense. Two of the disciples of John were there. The, one of them was Andrew, and he was the brother of Simon Peter. And so, having went and spent some time with Jesus and listened to Him and talked with Him and ate with Him and, and all of that, uh, Andrew is excited. And after all, they weren't you know, following John the Baptist because they just was looking for somebody to follow. They were following John the Baptist because he was talking about the Messiah that was to come. And so Andrew and this other disciple had the opportunity to see and meet the Messiah. And so Andrew, uh, he first findeth, I mean, after... He, they spend the day there after they spent that time with him. The very first thing that Andrew wants to do is find his brother Simon, Shimon. Simon, uh, who we will come to know as Simon Peter, uh, which also will be referred to as we'll see here as Cephas. Uh, he finds his own brother. He's excited. How do we know that? He, he said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And so Andrew's all excited. He goes looking. He finds his brother Peter. And, you know, we, we don't have an exclamation point here, but, you know, I, I think it's one of those exclamation point times that he finds his brother and, and he says unto him, We have found the Messiah. You know, the, he, he didn't have to explain to Peter what that means, you know, the Christ and those things. There, there's kind of a footnote here in the, the Scriptures for those who are reading and may not understand. So he's excited. Jesus has raised their level of expectation even greater. John prepared the way. John got them ready for Jesus, and they had heard John's preaching and the things that John had said. Now they spent time with Jesus and listened to Him teach. And uh, if we follow what Matthew says in, in Matthew chapter 7, at the end of that, he says that you know the people were astonished at His doctrine, for He spoke as one having authority, not as the, the scribes and the Pharisees. And so you can imagine sitting down a meal with Jesus and the type of discussions and questions and things that, that had arisen. And so we, we have Andrew here with, with John and then all of a sudden it's all notched up. And so he wants his brother to come and see. We have found the Messiah. And so verse 42, he brought him to Jesus and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. So he brings him to Jesus, implying that one, Peter knew what it meant when he said We've, we found the Messiah. He understood about the excitement. Peter wasn't just like have to be drug there. So he the, the implication in there, at least as I read it, is, is that Peter had no objection to going with Andrew to see him because he was like everybody else, especially those who were disciples of John, looking for this one that John kept preaching about. And so he goes. And Jesus, when he sees him, says that thou art Simon, uh, the son of Jonah. Simon bar Jonah. That's where you get that term. So the word bar, B-A-R, means son of. So he, you are Simon, uh, son of Jonah, and thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation of stone. And so uh, Cephas and Peter 
are in essence the, the, the same kind of thing. Petros, uh, is again, is a, is a stone. And so as we look at this, uh, Jesus is already making inroads with Peter. Of course, some people would, would try to just go with the, it just so happened that Jesus stumbled upon this person. But if Jesus was all-knowing, as we expect Him to be, Jesus understood what the future held, and He knew who Peter was even before He was introduced to him directly. And so Jesus begins to interact with him. He gives him a nickname right off, I mean, right off the bat, as we would call it, He gives him a nickname. He's, his name is Simon, son of Jonah, Simon Barjona. That's what he's been referred to and people know him as. And right off the bat, Jesus said, I'm going to give you an, another name. Your name's Cephas. And, and it means, uh, the footnote there says, it means a stone or Peter comes to be known as he, he comes to be known. Now, I have a little, just a little footnote here as we kind of finish up this morning because we're, we're going to uh, move into the, to the next day or the following day, uh, more being introduced to Jesus. And as we finish up our time here this morning, I want us to just take a look. Uh, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm assuming that most of the people who are with us this morning here in the auditorium have a King James Bible. But if you're using another translation, Many of those that are based on the newer, and I call them newer, they say they're older uh, writings, the older text, but many of the newer translations that use those scrolls say that he is Simon, son of John. So if your Bible there says that when Jesus met him, he said, you are Simon, son of John. Your Bible is using one of the new texts that have been brought into play rather than the received text that the King James came from. So, uh, and to me, this is a mistake. Whoever made that mistake in the scrolls has been... He, he is uh, John struck, if you want to say that. All through this first chapter, we have John the Apostle, we have John the Baptist, and we're just going back and forth and back and forth. This John, that John, this John, that John. It just keeps going back and forth. Uh, and so when the whoever came up with those scrolls was writing, they made a mistake and they translated Jonah as John, and they stuck the word John in there instead of Jonah. Now the other writers, the other places, it still says Simon bar Jonah, but they won't fix that. And so if your translation doesn't fix that, if it keeps it as Simon, the son of John, uh, and the reason for the mistake is, is that the difference between the word John and Jonah is, is very slim in the Greek. John, of course, is Yonis, and Jonas is Jonah. And so Yonis is John, and Jonas is Jonah. And so there's, there's basically a difference of a couple letters there. And so if you're not paying attention, uh, when you're copying that uh, and having copied John, 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 John all through the chapter, those newer translation scrolls that they're using, somebody who was copying it or doing it, whatever they were doing, uh, they have done that. So if you're testing a translation, I found this to be very accurate in many of the new translations that I have in my, my library. Almost every one of them still has in here Simon, son of John. And so they don't correct that even though, and I have seen people go way out of their way to try to say that 
that John and Jonah is, is, is the same thing, but it's not the same. Do what? This is Geneva Bible. J-O-N-A. Jonah. Yeah. And so uh, it's just a test, but if you wanted to, to see about your translation, we never, I mean, the, the religious world, very few, if I say, who is Simon Barjona? Everybody knows right off the bat, they'd say Peter. If I said, who is Simon Barjon? I don't, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. You mean Barjona? Yeah, that's what I mean. So even the average person knows that you don't call Simon the son of Jonah, or you don't call him the son of John, you call him the son of Jonah. And so it's, it's just a test. Uh, and, but that shows how careful some of the, 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 the copyists were when they were copying those scrolls. And if whoever's doing the more modern translation is not interested in fixing that, it makes you wonder what else they're not willing to fix or what else they're going to do. And it's just another reason why uh, I, I don't trust many of the, the newer translations because even a blatant mistake that needs to be fixed doesn't get fixed. But that being said, does anybody have any questions or comments down through 43 before we finish this morning? Yeah. Now John sent some of when John was in prison, he sent yeah. some of his disciples to Jesus and he asked him if he really was the Messiah because you know things didn't seem to be moving along at the kind of pace that John the Baptist thought they should be, but uh, Jesus gave them an answer to prove that yes, indeed, I am who, uh, who you thought I was and you should know that I was because that's, but uh, John's expectation was limited like many other people. God told him what he needed to know in the time that he needed to know it, but John the Baptist didn't have the answer to everything, even himself. Of course, Sadly, John the Baptist was not part. I know some people disagree with that, but he was not directly part of the church because the church wasn't established until the day of Pentecost. And so John the Baptist had been beheaded and, and was deceased before the church came into existence, at least in the, the sense that we think of it. And the place where they dwell, over there, they nothing like back here. A lot of them it varied from place to place depending on what Which you know have a, yeah a yeah but but it it, it it would vary I mean depending on who was offering the the place to stay and there were some places where people actually had guest houses which we think of as motels or whatever, and people would stay there. Just like the Good Samaritan, he left him there in the care of an innkeeper. Uh, other people had a place on the, on the roof, and, and it, it varied from, from place to place. Some may even had a, you know, another house even that, uh, that they allowed people to stay in. Lord willing, we'll pick up there next week. Thank you for your attention, your comments, your questions.